Okay, so what I have here is an RStudio environment where I've ran the code all the way through the end of video one. And as you recall from video one, we ended up with this particular graphic, this particular piece of ggplot2 awesomeness, uh, illustrating the propensity of ham and spam, ham being orange and spam being teal, based on a feature that we engineered called text length and how we talked about specifically that this feature may be helpful for us later on in our classification modeling. Okay, moving on in the text. So here's the thing. In machine learning, we are obsessed with creating models. In data science in general, we're obsessed with creating models that we can put in production and our business constituents can hang their hat on, that they can rely on to produce the business results that are desired. And in, and in machine learning and data science circles, that's known as generalization, right? Can your model actually generalize and perform well on data that is brand new, data that it's never seen before? So we're obsessed about that. So we, we have to take our data and we have to actually split it and segment it as part of that obsession to say, okay, look, if I, if I only use, if I use all of my data all the time to build and um, tune and improve my models, I never really have a way to check, to give myself a gut check to say, look, I'm pretty confident that this model will perform well in production on brand new data. Because we're obsessed about that, we actually say, okay, look, I can't use all of the data all at once. I need to actually take some of my data and hold it out, split it off, keep it over on the side, and then I can use that as a check. I use that, that data that I held out, that data that I split off to the side, to simulate, once my model's in production, brand new data that's coming in as a result of the business operation. And that by doing that, this gives me a way to estimate how generalizable my model is. This gives me a way to get a sense of if I put this model in production, how will it actually how well will it actually work in the real world? Okay. So we need to split our data to allow us to do that. So the first thing that we're going to do um, in the code is load up the mighty carrot package. The carrot package will provide us some functionality for splitting our data in such a way that we can achieve this goal. We can build our models, we can train our models, we can build new features and we can experiment. And then we can use the data that we split off and hold out to then verify, okay, how good is this model really? This, 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 data, this data that I'm holding on the side simulates the real world unseen data. I run it through my trained model and I say, okay, how good is it? Okay. So let's run this code here, and we're going to go ahead and pull up the carrot package. And you can see here, carrot stands for classification and regression training. Carrot is mighty. If you're if you're going to be a data scientist or a machine learning person or just a data professional in general, and you're going to use R as one of your primary tools, you are going to want to learn the carrot package. It is wildly wildly useful. So to show you. Go ahead and click on this, this help description here. And you can pull up the PDF. And what you get here is a document, which is really useful. I'm not going to drain it, but it gives you a brief introduction to the Carrot package and how to use it. Carrot provides a wealth of goodness to you as a data scientist. Not only does it provide functions like we'll see in a second that allow you to split your data in a very um, robust way, but it also provides an interface to allow you to program against literally more than 200 machine learning algorithms in a common way. So you don't have to go out and learn 200 different APIs. You can just use the Carrot API and you're off and running. And later in the video series, we'll actually use Carrot uh, with the, bright, the Mighty Random Forest. And I'll show you an example of how you can use Carrot to make your work even with the Random Forest much, much more productive. Okay. So... We've got the carrot package. So what we're going to do here is very is a very traditional sort of thing. We're going to go ahead and say, look, I don't get to use all 5,572 pieces of my data all at once here. Right? I don't get to use all of this data at once because I'm paranoid about building a model that will actually generalize in production. 
I can deploy the model in production, and I can be reasonably confident that it will work well when brand new data comes in, data that it's never seen before. So a typical split to simulate this is 70-30. I'm gonna keep 70% of my data for my training, 70% to build my model, 70% to play around with the data, to experiment, to create features, what have you. And this 30%, I'm gonna go ahead and hold out. And I'll use it to test my model, to actually test how good it is. This is a gut check. This is a gut check. So this is known as a 70-30 split. And typically these splits are known as the training split and the test split, not surprisingly. Now as a brief aside, I should mention that this, this, this is a pretty standard process that we're doing here, but it's also not necessarily the most ideal. Uh, what you would probably end up doing in reality, what I would advise doing in reality if you were doing this in a real world project, is you would actually split the data into three distinct chunks. And very briefly, what you would do is you would have a training data set, and you have a second data set, typically referred to as your validation data set, and you have a third one called test. The difference between that and what I just described is that the very last data set, the third one, the test set that you that you have at the very end, you only look at that at the very end of your project. The other two you use as part of your normal project process, but that third data set you use as a final, final gut check at the very end of your project. And that's mainly because you're so paranoid about generalizing your model. But that's that's a relatively advanced topic, so we'll stop there. What we're doing right here is very typical. Um, you'll see it in the literature all over the place. We're gonna do a 70-30 training test split, okay. Now, if I scroll up to some of the code that we ran in video one, one of the things that we discovered was this right here. We know that we have unequal proportions, right? We have 86.6% ham, we have 86.6% of our text messages are legitimate, and 13.4% of our messages are spam or illegitimate. So here's the thing, if I'm gonna split my data into a 70% training set and a 30% testing, if I just did that at random, it's entirely possible, and in fact, maybe even probable, that I wouldn't get these exact proportions, right? It's entirely possible that maybe this 30% test split, just because of the pure random nature of things, maybe had a higher percentage of spam than 13.4%. Maybe it was 20%, let's say. That can be a problem, right? If we split these data like this, we wanna make sure that each split, each chunk of this data is as representative of the original data set as possible. We want this 70% to be representative. Therefore, we want this 70% to have the same proportion of ham to spam. We want this 30% for the test set to be representative of the original data set. We want it to be the same proportion of ham versus spam. This is known as a stratified split. A stratified split. So what we need essentially is a function that allows us to do two things. Randomly sample our data and also ensure that the split is stratified, that these proportions are maintained across all of the splits. And not surprisingly, since caret is mighty, there's a function that we can use to do exactly that. So if we do create, do the help file and create data partition, you can see here that caret comes with a collection of data splitting functions, the first of which is the one we're interested in, which is create data partition. So you can go ahead and take a look at the help file at your leisure. I won't drain it. Let's just take a look at the code and I'll explain what's happening here in the code. Okay, so first up, we pass in to create data partition our label, which we've made a factor, it's a category, and create data partition can now use this and actually say, oh, okay, you wanna create some splits. I can figure out from this piece of data that you give me the proportions that I need to preserve. Right, this 86.6 versus 13.4 percent split. I will make sure that this proportion is constant across all the splits. And we say, okay, great, thank you. Carrot, also, I only want one split. I can actually ask for multiple splits, and the reasons why you would do that are beyond the scope of this course, but it shows you the power of 
caret where you can actually ask for multiple splits, um, you know, multiple iterations of this algorithm. But we only, we're only interested in one split. That's all we care about. So we only want one split. Next up, we can tell caret, hey, we want 70% of the data. Please give me a random sample of my data frame. Give me a random sample of these 5,572 operate, uh, observations. That is 70% of the size. I only want 70% selected at random. Please also make sure that the label proportions are maintained. And then lastly, by default, uh, create data partition will return you back an R list with a bunch of things in it. Typically, that's not what you want, I would argue. Typically, what you want back essentially is just give me the indexes, the row numbers that I want. Give me back the row numbers that are a 70% random sample of my data where the class label proportions are maintained. Okay, good enough. Next up, I should talk a little bit about this line of code. So right now we're setting the random seed because we want to ensure reproducibility. We want to make sure that what you see on your computer as you run this code is what you see on this video as I'm running it on my computer. So what this does is this tells your computer and my computer to start the random number generation at the same place. So that way we get the same set of random numbers. Your set will be the same as mine, which means that we will get the same 70% split. Okay. So let's go ahead and run these two lines of code. And let's talk about indexes now. So I asked R to run this function and store the results in a variable called indexes. And as you can see over here, it's an integer vector that is 3,901 integers in length. So if we do a quick math calculation here, you can see that 70% of our observation count of our original data set is approximately 3,900. Sweet, sweet. Now let's take a look at the first 20 values here. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, these are actually the row numbers. These are actually the row indices that we want. Notice that they're in ascending order, but there are gaps. Two and three are missing. Uh, seven, eight are missing, so on and so forth. That's because we didn't, we asked for only 70% of the data. So what this is saying is, hey, look, Dave, if you use this particular variable and you index into the data frame, you will get back 70% of the data frame at random where the proportion of the class labels is maintained. And we can see that right here. I ask R, hey, go to the spam.raw data frame, go ahead and filter it, and filter the rows by the indexes. Give me row one, row four, row 10, row 18, 25, so on and so forth. Go ahead and give me all the columns. Burn this line of code. Sure enough, I get 3,901 observations of three variables. And if I run this line of code, what I get is exactly the opposite. That's what this negation sign does. It says, hey R, do the opposite of this filter. I don't want the stuff that's in this filter. I want all the stuff that's not in this filter. So I run this line of code. Now I get 1,671 observations of three variables. Cool. And now I can once again use prop table to verify that I get the proper splits and the proper proportions. And you can see here, sure enough, 86.6 and 13.4%. So the training has the right proportion and the test has the right proportion, which means that now I have a 70-30 split of my data that is representative of the original data set in terms of ham versus spam. Excellent. So that means I can use this to build and tune and improve my models. And when I'm ready, I can use this data here to verify how well will it actually work in production? Give me some sense of how well it work will it actually work in production. Sweet. Okay. All right. So we've got our we've got our data split up. We've got our training data set. So now we're good to go. Now we can start doing some interesting things. So now is a perfect time for us to actually understand. Okay. Now that I've got this text data in this column, what do I do with it? How do I transform it from this raw blob of textual goodness? into something that R can understand 
and I can use to actually train a accurate ham spam classification model. The core idea that we need to, to get our heads around is, is this. How do we represent text as a data frame, right? This is a representational question. R only understands data frames, right? We know this is R coders. So how do we get text to look like a data frame? How do we get unstructured data into a structured format? Now, the answer is actually pretty obvious, and I'm sure most of you already know this, which is, okay, fine, Dave, it's pretty simple. If I've got a bunch of textual data, make every word in my text data into a column. That's the easiest way to take this unstructured data and make it structured in a, in a tabular format that R can understand and work with. Okay, so let's see how we actually do that in practice. So let's take this hypothetical document here. And this is what's known as the duck test. If it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. So let's take this very simple example and say, okay, look, let's walk through this conceptually to say, all right, how do I represent this unstructured data in a structured way that R can understand? And the process by which we do that is known as tokenization. So essentially we say, look, um, let's go ahead and decompose our textual document or our textual documents into distinct pieces or tokens. So if we apply tokenization to the hypothetical document, right, or the duck test, this tokenization process could, and I emphasize could, and I'll explain why in a second, could produce the following set of tokens. And nothing surprising here. If you just look at this, you can say, okay, Dave, all you did was essentially say anything that isn't white space is a token, right? First word, even punctuation like commas and periods, everything is a token other than white space because well, white space isn't anything, so we don't really need to worry about it. So all this is tokens. Now, the reason why I use the word could is because we're gonna run through a very simple hypothetical example here in, this, in these slides, but as you'll quickly find um, later on in the series as we work with Quantita, and as you expand your data science skills in the text analytics space on your journey in text analytics, looking at other packages and other functions, what you'll quickly find is tokenization itself is actually a broad subject as well. And there are many, many different ways to tokenize textual data, all with different characteristics and all with different goals in mind. So we're actually going to use the, the simplest approach, because once again, as we talked about in video one, we're, we're following the 80-20 rule. We're going to use the 20% of stuff that's 80% useful and this sort of tokenization scheme is broadly applicable across a huge number of problem spaces. Okay, so we could get tokens that look like this. All right, moving on. Okay, next up, once we have tokenization complete, we can create what is known as a document frequency matrix or a data frame, right, or a table. They're all essentially synonyms. Data frame, matrix, table, they're all essentially a square data construct. Okay, so we can create this document frequency matrix and it has three specific properties that are important. First up, in a document frequency matrix, each row in the data frame, each row in the table, each row in the matrix represents a single document in your collection. In our particular case, with the SMS data, each row will represent a specific SMS text message. Each column in the matrix, in the data frame, in the table, represents a distinct token. And we'll see that in a second here, what that means. And then lastly, each cell, so each intersection of a column and a row, contains the count of that token for a document, for a particular document. As we'll see in a second, this representation is wildly useful. Again, under the 80-20 rule, this document frequency matrix representation gets you very, very far in practice. Now, there are many, many advanced uh, text analytics techniques that do not rely on this necessarily, but you would be surprised at how far you can get in a very, very large number of scenarios using this representation. Uh, and in, in many ways, it is the de facto standard if you're doing classification, uh, predictive models on textual data. Okay. So 
Here is our hypothetical DFM for our document. Now notice, first up, we have what are known as the terms. These are the distinct tokens. Now notice that duck actually showed up as a token in as a as a token in our process a total of four times. You can see that here, right? If it walks like a duck, so on and so forth. Duck showed up four times. However, it doesn't probably make a lot of sense for us to actually have duck as four separate columns in our data frame. So the distinct token, the singleton instance of a token across all of our documents is what's known as a term. So if we had 4,000, 5,000 documents, whatever, any of them that had duck would have their duck counts right here in this single column. As we talked about before, the rows are documents. In this particular case, we only have one document, so we only have one row. In the case of our training data that we just created, we'll have 3,301 rows in that particular DFM for our training set because that's how many documents we have. And you'll notice the frequencies are here, right? Just the counts. Duck showed up four times, like showed up three times, we had three commas, so on and so forth. Okay. All right, moving on. So here's the thing to remember about this particular representation. Notice that word ordering is not preserved, right? We know that duck actually shows up if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck, right? Duck shows up like here and here and here positionally. But notice that because we collapse everything down to a singleton instance of a term, that we lose word ordering. And in fact, actually, we could jumble this all up and it wouldn't matter because we lose word ordering anyway. So it doesn't really matter how these columns are actually um, set up. We could swap them all around and it doesn't matter. What really matters is that we have a single column for a singleton term and then we have the count. That's what really matters. So word ordering is not preserved. So this is super important. This particular setup is what's known as the bag of words model. Because since word ordering isn't, isn't preserved, you can just think of it as a big jumble of words in a bag, right? It's just word counts. That's all it is. And some folks, when they initially learn about this, go, oh, wait a second. Hey, look, Dave, I ain't, wow, how can you just throw out word ordering? That's kind of important. That's how we communicate. And the answer is, yes, that's absolutely true. But once again, you'd be surprised at how far you can get, how much, how much power you can get in these models by, not, by getting rid of word ordering. It doesn't really matter. Um, We'll see later on when we talk about n-grams that there's a way to actually add back in word ordering into this model. But in the beginning, you'll be surprised at how far you can get by just saying, look, you know what? Just find all of these interesting terms for me and just use the counts. You'll get really, really far, believe it or not. It's actually very, very powerful. So not surprisingly, this bag of words model is a very, very common representation. Again, under the 80-20 rule that we've talked about, this is going to be used in 80% of your projects, especially if you're doing classification models, whether that's what we're doing here, which is spam detection, or if you're doing sentiment analysis, or you're trying to classify legal briefs or loan documents, whatever, right? This is going to be the de facto standard. This is where you're going to, where you're going to start most of the time. The bag of words model is extremely powerful, it's extremely flexible. As I said, we'll add, when we talk about n-grams, we'll add some notion of word order back into the bag of words model to extend its power, and we'll see that it has the possibility of making our models even more accurate. But this, this BOW model, this bag of words model, is extremely common and is the de facto standard. Okay, so given this hypothetical basis we've got some some considerations that we need to enumerate and this this and I will admit this is going to be a bit of a shock and awe slide uh, we're going to go over a lot of things to consider we're going to address each in turn in the R code but I wanted just to put this in the back of your mind these are all things that you need to consider when you're doing a text analytics project so first and foremost is do we want all the tokens 
to be terms in our DFM, in our document frequency matrix. So for example, we saw that in our hypothetical um, bag of words model that the first word in the sentence in our document was if with a capital I. Now, strictly speaking, hypothetically speaking, if the word if showed up somewhere else in the document, it may not be capitalized. So you would have if with a capital I and if not with a capital I. And strictly speaking, most, most, um, most R processing that you would do would actually treat these as two separate terms. You would actually have two separate if columns, one for capital if and one for lowercase if. And the answer is that the question is, generally speaking, do you want that actually in your model? Usually the answer is no. So typically what you end up finding is most of the time you're just going to lowercase all of your textual data. Now, some of you may be screaming, in, uh, screaming at the screen right now going, Dave, whoa, 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 how can you get rid of casing? Casing actually matters. There's signal in that. And that's true. There is. And there are more advanced text analytics techniques that you can use that take advantage of capitalization. But once again, and I know I'm going to sound like a broken record here, you'll be surprised at how far you can get in text analytics with this very simple bag of words approach. And one of the things that you do is you say, look, I don't worry about capitalization. I'll just go ahead and lowercase everything and it'll work itself out in the end. So that's the first thing you need to consider. So next up, you need to consider punctuation. Do I want punctuation in my, in my term frequency matrix? Do I want periods and exclamation points and question marks and double quotes and all that sort of thing, what have you? And the answer typically is no, you don't. Because as, as, you, as we said on the previous slide, the bag of words model doesn't preserve word ordering. Therefore, it does not preserve sentence structure. Therefore, punctuation really doesn't give you anything. So we typically strip that all out. Now again, there are more advanced text analytics techniques that can take advantage of punctuation and sentence structure. But again, you'll find out, you'll, you'll be amazed at how far you can get with this simple bag of words model and just ignore sentence structure. Next up, do you want numbers? Do you want the actual digits in your data? Sometimes you do, and most of the time you do not. Now, just to be, just to be crystal clear on this point, we're talking about just the digits. The word zero, Z-E-R-O, would stay in. We're talking about the digit zero. Would we strip that out? Most of the time, a lot of the time, you strip out numbers, but not always. It's something you need to consider. Next up is, do you want every word to become a term? Do you want every word, every token, to actually become a term in your DFM? For example, the word the. It's the single most common commonly occurring word in the English language, it usually adds no value whatsoever. Collectively, words like the and uh and etc. are known as stop words. Every language has stop words. They're essentially grammatic sugar. It allows the language to flow. But strictly speaking, they don't add any semantics. They don't add any predictive power. So usually we strip stop words out because we don't want them in our, in our, in our DFMs. Next up, we have symbols. Now, this is more important these days than it was in years past because of the advent of social media. So, for example, sentiment analysis of, twi of, Twitter, of Twitter feeds, very, very popular, very, very useful. You have to worry about things like at symbols and hashtags. Ten years ago, you'd probably just strip this stuff out because it didn't really matter. But nowadays, depending on what you're doing, there may be signal. So you have to decide what you're going to do with symbols like this. Next up, we have similar words. So in the English language, for example, we have ran, run, runs, and running. This is an example of what, we, of what we'll come to see is known as stemming, which is, okay, look, is it possible for me to collapse very similar words into a single representation? So instead of having four columns in my data frame, one for ran, one for run, one for runs, and one for running, can I collapse all three of these down into a single representation? Maybe just the word run. Transform ran to run, runs to run, running to run. 
And stemming actually does that for us. It creates, allows us to collapse words down into a, a single representation because arguably um, in one context, these all essentially have the same meaning, which is a human being moving as fast as possible under their own power. I ran all the way home. I'm going to go for a run. Is Dave running? Why is Dave running? Right Now, some of you are probably jumping to the next next idea, which is, okay, Dave, that makes sense. But you know what? These words can actually be used in a different context. So it, maybe it's not just about a human being moving as fast as they can under their own power. Maybe this is in the computer domain or the IT domain. Go run the program. Has the batch job ran? Is the job currently running? So on and so forth. So as it turns out, Generally speaking, in this simple bag of words model approach, typically we don't have to worry so much about that. What, we, what we're mainly concerned with is collapsing these four terms into a single term. So we only have one column in our, in our um, DFM, in our matrix, in our data frame. And we can figure out the other types of contexts based on the word counts that are also in the document. So for example, in the IT domain, you'd probably have things like hard drive or disk or server or CPU or very computer specific, IT specific terms that would show up that would allow you to derive implicitly the context that this is actually used, these words are being used in the context of computer systems and not in the context of human beings moving as fast as they can under their own power. So typically we don't worry so much about that second aspect we primarily concern ourselves in the bag of words model with collapsing these things down. So what you can garner from all of this, from this shock and awe slide, is that pre-processing of textual data is a major, major part of text analytics. Now this is true in general for all data science and all machine learning projects, but I would argue it's especially true with text analytics because you're dealing with the dirtiest of dirty data. So you have to spend a lot of time and a lot of care analyzing your data, understanding your data, and making sure you're doing the right thing. Now, in this particular video series, as I said in, the, in video one, for simplicity's sake, we're going to, I'm just going to wave my hands a little bit in certain cases and say, well, you know, if you did this in the real world, you would actually do this and this and this and the other thing, because this is very much an introductory um, series. So just want you to keep this in the back of your mind as we're going through the rest of the R code that you're going to need all the, in a production scenario, as you apply these these tools and techniques in your day job, these all this this these all these considerations you're going to need to keep in the back of your mind. Okay, all right. I will go ahead and stop there since we're a little bit over time right now. Hopefully, you're enjoying this video series. I'm having a lot of fun making it. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe to the Data Science Dojo YouTube channel. We're going to be producing content on a regular basis, and subscribing is the best way to keep abreast of all the things that we do. Next up, we uh, if you like what we're doing in general, feel free to follow us on social media. We actually produce uh, a plethora of hand curated data science goodness. And if you follow us on social media, you can tap into that data feed. And lastly, I hope to see you in one of our upcoming data science boot camps. So until next time, this is Dave Langer and I'm wishing you very, very happy data sleuthing.